Greetings everyone and welcome to Ion Africa. My name is Awasar. I am assistant I am assistant director for academic affairs at the African Studies Center here at Michigan State University and Ion Africa is our weekly seminary series. We are very delighted today to have Dr. Joanna Allen as our guest speaker and before I pass it over to her a brief introduction. Dr. Allen is senior lecturer at the Center for International Development, Northumbria University, UK. Her research focuses on resistance to neo-colonial natural resource exploitation, histories of women's anti-colonial resistance movement, Sahrawi and Equator, Equator Guinean resistance literatures, environmental justice, and the relationship between energy and culture. In 2022, she won a Philip Leverham Prize, which will allow her to embark on a new research project focused on phosphate imaginaries, as well as to pen a biography of four influential Sahrawi cultural activists. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation of being here today. I pass it over to you now. Dr. Sawan, thank you so much for inviting me uh, and thank you to the African Studies Centre more widely for inviting me. And thanks everyone for coming along today. Um, it's a real pleasure to get the chance to talk to you about my research. Uh, so as Dr. Sawan said, I'm Joanna Allen. I'm based um, in the Centre for International Development at Northumbria University, which is located in the north of England. Um, my background is in the humanities, um, specifically Hispanic studies. Uh, so the talk that I'm giving today is framed from a humanities perspective. Um, and I'm situating the research project that, that I'll talk about today um, in the subfield of energy humanities. Um, so this is a field that looks at how energy shapes society in general. Um, although I'm more interested in how societies and specifically understandings of weather shape energy. Um, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, so the case that I'm using to explore these ideas is Western Sahara, as you probably know from the title of my um, talk. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll try to limit myself to 45, 50 minutes so that there's plenty of time for some discussion. Um, if you enjoy the talk today or find the topic interesting and would like to know more, um, I have a book on this topic um, and to contract with West Virginia University Press. Um, so look out for that um, if, if the, the topic is of interest. Uh, so on to the paper. Uh, currently, as you'll know, we're facing a climate crisis, um, one which requires, among several other measures, a transition from uh, fossil fuels as energy sources to renewable sources of energy. So scholars working in energy humanities have um, taken on some of the academic work to address this climate crisis um, and the transition away from oil by exploring our cultural entanglements with fossil fuels. Um, what I'm trying to do with my work is move the focus onto the sources to which we, we, we want to transition. Um, so looking at our cultural entanglements um, with wind, in my case. Um, so in my current research project, um, I look at, I'm looking at how historical and current colonial cultural entanglements with wind shape the development of energy infrastructure um, in political and aesthetic ways. Um, and I'm also looking at how alternative relationships with wind or different ways of imagining and understanding wind might inform a more socially just energy transition. So my, my, my contention or my hypothesis um, in my project is that the ways we imagine or understand energy sources such as wind is inextricable inextricably tangled up with the wider energy system. So by that, I mean energy infrastructure, energy policy and energy use. Um, so the imaginations of wind or the meanings we attach to wind and, and the wind blown um, have implications for the politics that renewable energy systems mediate. Um, and I find uh, the concept of energy regimes useful here. 
So um, a scholar called Douglas Rogers um, conceptualized um, an energy regime as a political system in which energy companies join state agencies in molding and transforming citizens. So I use the concept of energy political regimes, um, but I want to emphasize the role of energy imaginaries and imaginaries of wind and also of the Sahara Desert, the Sahara Desert being the embodiment of, of wind blowing processes um, in the wider energy regimes and energy systems of Western Sahara. Um, and I say the energy systems in the plural because there are different energy systems in Western Sahara. Those in the past, there was the Spanish colonial energy system um, at the moment, because part of Western Sahara is under Moroccan occupation. There's the Moroccan and corporate um, led energy system in occupied Western Sahara. And the indigenous people of Western Sahara have a state in exile in Algeria, where they're also developing their own energy system. Um, so the, there are various systems which I'll compare. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I'm using Western Sahara as my case study. Um, and apologies to anyone who is already familiar with the case of Western Sahara, um, but um, I'm going to give some background and context now for those who might not be familiar um, with the case. Um, this is the uh, UN map of Western Sahara. Western Sahara was a Spanish colony until 1975. Um, in 1975, rather than decolonizing what was known then as Spanish Sahara, Spain uh, sold it to neighboring Morocco and Mauritania in exchange for uh, continued access to Western Sahara's very rich fisheries and for a share in the profits from Western Sahara's phosphate mine, which the, the Spanish had built there. And that phosphate mine is actually still a key source of phosphates in the world even today. Um, with regard to Morocco's position, so Morocco claimed uh, and still claims that before Spain colonized Western Sahara, so before 1884, uh, the territory that today is known as Western Sahara was actually part of the Moroccan Sultanate. Um, and to legitimize Morocco's in invasion of Western Sahara, Morocco actually took this claim to the International Court of Justice. However, the International Court of Justice uh, published an advisory opinion on the matter, and its opinion was that um, this was not the case, that before Spanish colonization, Western Sahara was not part of the Moroccan Sultanate and there were no ties um, uh, that constituted um, ones of sovereignty. Um, and so the International Court of Justice recommended that the indigenous Sahrawis have their right to, to self-determination. Um, despite this um, advisory opinion though, Morocco still invaded the country from the north and Mauritania invaded from the south. Um, so this was in 1975. Um, before that, during the Spanish colonial era, the indigenous Saharawis had uh, begun to fight for decolonization. So there already existed an anti-colonial movement um, before 1975 um, called the Polisario Front. So that was founded in 1973 to fight for independence from Spain. And then from 1975, um, Polisario was then struggling against Morocco and Mauritania for, for its um, for decolonization. Um, so upon the invasion, Saharawis fled eastwards. Um, they uh, camped in the uh, east of the country um, initially within Western Sahara, but they were bombed on at least four known occasions with napalm. Um, by Morocco, so it became clear that they weren't safe anywhere in their own country. So they fled further eastwards to Algeria. Um, and hopefully you can see in the southwest corner of the bit of Algeria that you can see on that map, this town called Tindouf. Um, so this is where the Sahari refugees fled. And uh, Algeria gave the Sahari space to form refugee camps there. And in 1976, um, the Polisario declared these refugee camps a state in exile. Um, so the Sahrawi uh, Arab Democratic Republic in exile. 
Um, so today there's about 200,000 refugees that um, live there. Um, and they are refugee camps, but they have most things that you'd expect a, a state to have as well. So they have schools and hospitals, and elections, and so on. Um, not all Sahrawis fled, so there is a small population of Sahrawis that still live um, in the part of Western Sahara that is occupied by Morocco. Um, so I should point out there that not all of Western Sahara is occupied by Morocco. So on this map, you can see a red line bisecting the territory. So this is a military wall that was built by Morocco in the 80s to separate the part it occupies from the part to the east, which um, the Polisario controls. Um, in 1979, Mauritania withdrew from the war and recognized the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. Um, so since 1979, um, it, it's just uh, Morocco that occupies the most part of the territory. So this military wall is actually the longest active military wall in the world. And on the UN map, it appears as just one. In actual fact, there's about seven more that go across um, as well. So you can't really move around the country without crossing walls and um, passing through checkpoints and so on. Um, so, in terms of um, occupied Western Sahara, human rights NGOs regard it as one of the best places in the world in terms of political freedoms. Um, so, the, the Sahrawis really live um, through a very brutal um, oppression um, in, in that region. Um, in terms of the part of Western Sahara in the east, which is controlled by Polisario, it's very heavily landmined. Um, Polisario had been clearing landmines there for, for, for years, so there, there, there were nomads that, that lived there. Um, however, uh, armed conflict has recently resumed between Polisario and Morocco, which means that there's been an exodus of nomads, but we'll come back to that later. Um, so I say resumes, the conflict did stop for a long time. In 1991, the UN brokered a ceasefire between Polisario and Morocco, and the ceasefire was predicated upon the promise of a self-determination referendum on independence for the indigenous Sahrawis. However, that referendum never happened. Um, there's been, Morocco had initially agreed to, uh, to allow the referendum, um, but they continuously blocked it. And there's been various peace plans over the years none of which have, have gone anywhere really. So between 1991 and, and 2020, there was um, a ceasefire, but a, a, a diplomatic stalemate. Um, and during that time, Morocco took advantage of the ceasefire to move a um, larger and larger settler population into occupied Western Sahara, which is um, a, um, a contravention of the, the Geneva Convention. Um, so why does Morocco bother occupying Western Sahara? Um, there are many reasons. One of them, though, um, one which um, Sahrawis often raise, is the issue of natural resources. So I mentioned earlier that the Spanish built a phosphate mine in Western Sahara, um, and that, that's still a, a, um, a key source of phosphates for the world today. Phosphates are needed in agricultural fertilizers, so they're key for the whole um, uh, world food system, um, but there's other resources too. Um, the Moroccan royal family and lots of French corporations own industrial sized greenhouses um, in Western Sahara and they produce a lot of fruit and vegetables for the European market. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier, Western Sahara is very rich fisheries. Um, so, so, likewise, um, here in Europe, we get a lot of tin tuna tin sardines and so on um, that, that are coming from, from Western Sahara. Western Sahara also has oil. It, it hasn't yet been found in commercial quantities, but there are oil companies um, looking for it there. Um, and renewable energy, the topic of that's most of interest to me at the moment, um, is produced in Western Sahara and it's of ever increasing value to the Moroccan king. So Polisario um, 
liberation movement of the Sahara region has repeatedly asked the UN to intervene to stop Morocco's exploitation of Western Sahara's natural resources. Uh, the UN did publish a legal opinion on this matter in 2002, and it found that the exploitation of Western Sahara's resources without the consent of indigenous Sahrawis um, is illegal. And over the last few years, there's been numerous court cases on this issue. Um, so there's been cases here in England, several cases in the EU's Court of Justice, um, and a case in South Africa's High Court, uh, which have draw, drawn the same conclusion as the UN. Um, involving resources from tinned fish to agricultural project produce to phosphates. Um, so these are states or groups of states exploiting these resources should have the consent of the indigenous people, not settlers, um, if this were to be legal. Um, since I'm presenting to you in the US today, perhaps it's worth mentioning that there are also several US companies involved in this illegal exploitation. Um, General Electric is involved in one of the wind energy developments in occupied Western Sahara um, that I'll be discussing later. Um, Caterpillar provides vehicles for the phosphate mine and Cosmos Energy, which I believe is headquartered in Texas, was one of the first companies to drill for oil offshore um, of Western Sahara's waters. And they did that in partnership with a company that's local to me, so just over the border in southern Scotland, um, and also in partnership with the Moroccan Kings Energy Company. Um, so first mass energy is inactive in, in Western Sahara at the moment. I should clarify that. Um, so I mentioned that um, after almost a three decades ceasefire, the war had recently broken out again between Morocco and Polisario. So this, that happened in November, 2020. Um, shortly after this um, uh, resumption of armed conflict, um, Donald Trump waded in with his views, with some tweets. Um, so, and he, so he made these tweets um, three weeks after their return to war. Let me just read them out for you. So the first one was at the bottom. Today I signed a proclamation recognizing Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara. Morocco's serious, credible and realistic autonomy proposal is the only basis for a just and lasting solution for enduring peace and prosperity. Another historic breakthrough today, our two great friends, Israel and the Kingdom of Morocco have agreed to full diplomatic relations, a massive breakthrough for peace in the Middle East. Morocco recognized the United States in 1777. It is thus fitting we recognize the sovereignty over the Western Sahara. So Trump is referencing here the Abraham Accords in which Morocco normalized relations with Israel in return for US recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. So through this, the Trump administration became the first government in the world and the only government in the world to ever have officially recognized Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. Um, Western Sahara's official status for the UN is a non-self-governing territory, or in other words, a colony. So it's um, the last colony in Africa. Um, so um, Trump here mentions Moroccan uh, autonomy plan. So the, the current um, proposed solution to the conflict from Morocco is to give Sahara's limited autonomy under Moroccan rule. Sahrawi rejects. Um, it wouldn't give them their legitimate right to, to self determination and, and independence. Um, so, since um, these Abraham Accords, um, we've seen um, an Israeli oil company begin to look for oil in Western Sahara in its offshore waters in partnership with the Scottish company that used to work with Cosmos, uh, the company local to me. Um, and we're also seeing Israeli drones being used in strikes against Sahrawi nomads that live in the eastern part of Western Sahara, controlled by, by Polisario. Um, so going back to the outbreak of war, it's relevant that the trigger, there's many reasons 
more complex reasons behind the return to war, but the trigger um, centered on the issue of natural resource exploitation. Um, so the breaking of the ceasefire in November 2020 happened um, near a place called Gergerat, um, which is on this map here. You can see the village of Gergerat above the white line, which is the military wall. And below the white line is a demilitarized restricted zone, um, which is controlled by, by the Polisario. Um, and just below this white line, um, there's a road there. And um, it's along this road that um, produce destined for the European market and others, such as fruit and veg, um, road in Occupy Rosentara. It comes down this road and it's taken to Nuwadibu port in Mauritania and then um, is shipped to markets abroad. So, so how do we see this road as the plunder corridor, they call it? And for several years, Sahrawi civilians have been mounting roadblocks here in protest at what they see as the plunder of their country. And so in November 2020, there was another road and, um, on the Polisario control side of the wall. Um, Morocco and the Moroccan military fired on these protesters and Polisario fired back. And that was the moment this fire ended. Um, so at, at this time, um, I was in touch with Sahrawi friends who were taking part in the roadblock, and one of them called Limama Layachi um, sent me a voice note about it, and um, I quote him here. So he said, Our purpose was to close down the illegal breach at Gergerat. It's a gate through which Morocco passes our plundered natural resources to Mauritania and other countries. So this is why I say that, that natural resources are with the trigger for, for the end of the ceasefire. Um, C.D. Breaker, he's the Polisario representative to the UK, and he explained to me, and I'll quote him, Polisario Front decided to withdraw from the ceasefire agreement as a response to the military aggression of the Moroccan army against Sahrawi civilians who were legally and peacefully protesting against the Gergerat illegal breach and the continuous plundering of their natural resources. Um, so Sahrawis for a long time have made it clear that the exploitation of Western Sahara's natural resources would result in an end to the ceasefire. Um, and of all the items on the long list of exploited resources, I'd argue that the exploitation of renewable energy has constituted one of the greatest threats to Sahrawi independence, and therefore it has contributed exponentially to this recent 2020 return to war after three decades of ceasefire. And this is because energy is an only booty to be sold off for profit, um, but it's inextricably tangled up in politics, territorial expansion and violence, as I'll explain now. So since 2009, Morocco has overseen the rapid development of renewable energy infrastructure in occupied Western Sahara. So Morocco makes its colony a source of electrical power and therefore it strengthens its hold on Western Sahara by way of the irreversibility of physical infrastructure and energy dependence. Um, so if it makes itself dependent on Western Sahara for energy, then it, 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 it's much less likely that it'll ever decolonize. So the metal strands of transmission lines connect one territory to the other in a literal material way as well. Um, the cables crisscrossing the Moroccan Western Sahara border mirror Morocco's discourse of territorial integrity, which imagines Western Sahara as an integral part of the Moroccan nation. And then beyond, the Moroccan grid links to the EU energy market by way of submarine connections. Um, so the energy is eventually exported to Western Sahara's former colonial power, Spain. Um, at the moment, about a quarter of Morocco's renew renewable energy comes from Western Sahara. Um, but there's plenty more developments under construction at the moment. So soon that share is likely to, to increase to, to half. Um, Morocco's main corporate partner and the only foreign corporate partner to be involved in all Moroccan government wind development in occupied Western Sahara is Spanish company Siemens Gamesa, 
67% of which is owned by the German company Siemens. Um, so, so far, Siemens has provided the mills for five energy developments in Western Sahara, um, and two of these provide energy exclusively for industries and not for benefiting residents. Um, and that includes a wind farm for the phosphate mine, um, for example. Um, and with regard to the other three um, farms that, that Siemens has provided mills for, um, Siemens partner in those is the Rocket King's own energy company. So this is quite a lucrative business for the, the Moroccan King himself. So this removes the incentive for the Moroccan King to engage meaningfully with any peace process. Um, so this is um, a map of um, wind and solar developments. So the red ones are up and running. The one that General Electric invo is involved with is the um, after sap. Uh, wind farm, um, and uh, the the yellow ones are sort of planned or under construction. Um, so, if you have a look, look at some of those, you can see um, which ones are, are built purely for for industry. Um, the largest wind farm, the nine hundred megawatt Hamatan wind farm, will be used exclusively for powering a Bitcoin mine. So um, when companies say that they're, they're benefiting residents' energy, it's not necessarily um, always ready that way. Um, so Siemens build these wind farms against the express wishes of the Sahrawi um, and also the express wishes of Sahrawi civil society, which have um, uh, tried to engage Siemens many times. And Siemens build them, builds them in consultation with no one the Moroccan government. Um, I look at now um, in terms of issues, which is imagined, meaning attached to wind is how Siemens presents its activities in, in occupied Western Sahara. So this is a screenshot of um, what was the Siemens in Morocco homepage. Not the Siemens webpage now because Siemens Gamesa, the Spanish subsidiary, has taken over operations in Western Sahara. But luckily, I had taken a screenshot of it because I find, um, find it interesting. Um, I find the aesthetics of the image interesting. Um, and also, um, here I have a link to a corporate video which was embedded on this home page. Um, so I'm going to just play a few seconds of this video which is presenting Siemens activities in Occupy Western Sahara, which it, which it refers to as Morocco. Um, and um, I'd ask you just to listen to the sound effects and the interplay of sound and then the voiceover um, as the text appears on the screen. We're not hearing. We're not hearing the sound. Right. Um, thanks for letting me know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, can you see the um, video? No, we're just seeing the picture. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, right. I'll st I'll stop sharing and try again. Okay. okay. Right, let's see. Okay, let's try again. Are you seeing that? We're seeing but not hearing. You might have to share sound. Uh, okay, I see. I'll stop sharing and try again. Bear with me, hopefully I'll get there. Yep, yeah, you're right, uh, Dr. Sarah. I hadn't clicked the share sound button. Now we can. Yeah. Thanks. To 
draw the wind, you must tame it, understand its direction, its power and its energy. Drawing the wind means... Um, so the video opens just for a few seconds with this howling desert wind sound, quite desolate. And uh, that sound makes way for motivational music just at the moment that Siemens presents, comes on the screen as if representing the colonial encounter. And then the imagery of sound blowing in relative emptiness um, and the way the camera angles point upwards from the bottom of the mill to make the mills look as large and huge and majestic as possible is meaningful, I think. Um, and looking back at the picture from the screenshot from the Siemens homepage, um, the dull colour palette, um, I think, emphasises the idea of an empty desert. So it's this um, typical col European colonial idea of terra nullius, of, of no man's land. Um, and I think um, in terms of the voiceover, it's useful to take away the idea of Siemens describing its role as taming um, and understanding the wind. Um, so we've got, again, these uh, European colonial cliches of, of taming a, a barbaric land and of understanding so colonial knowledge of a, of a, a terra nullius. Um, and the camels are possibly there to suggest that this windfall definitely fits into Sahari's traditional lifestyle, Sahari's nomadic camel pluralist. The irony of this picture is that the wind farm pictured here was partially built on land grabbed from an elderly Sahari woman who was arrested when she complained about it and now has nowhere to, to graze her animals. Um, and I'm told that that woman wasn't alone. So of three other Sahari families um, whose land was stolen from them with no consultation, warning or compensation to make way for this farm. So what this tells me is that for Siemens, Saharis are completely disposable. They haven't made uh, capitalist use of their waste sandy lands and, and howling wild winds. Therefore, they can be robbed from, full stop. Uh, so as I mentioned, Siemens, um, and I'm talking more widely about their promotional materials, not just um, this video and web page now, um, but the materials I've looked at in the wider project. So it borrows and patches its discourse on Saharan winds from warm European colonial stereotypes with recourse of ideas of terra nullius, of no man's land, of desert wasteland, um, and also highlights the West's apparent technological acumen in overcoming climatological barriers, mainly wind barriers in the desert, and thereby implies the indigenous people, um, their lack of initiative in finding a way to put the useless and hostile desert and its howling wild winds to useful work. Um, I think Siemens uses perspective to emphasize the enormity of their installations, um, the white cylindrical curves suggest futuristic technological prowess and sophistication in design. And they try to emphasize this by juxtaposing such images with images of flat, rocky scrub and spiky, sparse more emphasizing this idea of what's been here as a terra nullius wasteland. Um, of course, it's nothing new for a multinational to draw on colonial cliches to justify dubious activities in the global south. But what's of interest to me here is the centrality of wind and aeolian geomorphology. So that's the, the processes by which wind um, landscapes um, in the 
colonial discourse as used by Siemens. Um, so my contention in my project and in this paper is that how an energy source is imagined underpins how the wider energy system is works and how it's managed. Um, so in other words, in this case, how wind is mad imagined by the art architects of an energy system, in this case, Siemens, in occupied Western Sahara, is like a litmus test for the type of politics mediated by that energy system. Um, so we've looked at, at Siemens's colonizing discourses of wind and desert. Um, and what I want to do now is um, give you a little bit of an insight into the energy politics and power relations that we see around the energy developments and the energy system in occupied Western Sahara by looking at Sahrawi perspectives of, of the energy system in occupied Western Sahara. So for this part of the project, I worked with um, two Sahrawi researchers called Mahmoud Lamadal and Hamza Lakhal. And our work was based on two research phases. The first was an ethnography of domestic energy blackouts in occupied Western Sahara, which I carried out while I was staying in the house of, um, of um, some Sahrawi friends. And the second phase was interviews that were carried out mainly by Hamza and Mahmoud. And, um, and they focused on trying to talk to Sahrawis who, who don't self-identify as activists. So the idea was to try and gauge the opinions of ordinary Sahrawis, not, not necessarily Sahrawis that are, are vocally pro-independence or um, regularly, regularly involved in um, challenging the work of companies like Siemens. Um, so this is a whole other paper and I'll, 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 I'll give you the link to that if you're interested at the end. But I just wanted to highlight the main findings now because they're, they're of relevance to, to the points I'm trying to make in this talk. Um, so we found that um, when we discussed the issue of power outages with Sahrawis, um, it brought up a host of um, political and political economic, politico economic contentions, um, which revealed how the Moroccan occupation enters into and shapes the possibilities of daily life in the Sahrawi home through electricity cables or the lack of electricity cables in many cases. So lots of Sahrawis that we talked to lacked the funds to pay for grid energy. And of those that were connected to the grid, power cuts were understood to be um, an orchestrated method through which the occupying regime punishes them as a community. Um, so they felt that power electricity was purposefully cut off um, in districts dominated by Sahrawis. So in certain suburbs which are dominated by Sahrawis and Moroccan settlers live in, in, in other suburbs. So Sahrawis felt that the energy could be and was used as a form of collective punishment. Um, so this they said that power outages tend to happen at um, particular moments, um, for example, when Morocco is moving um, into the territory or if there's any military manoeuvre, um, it's more likely that there'd be a power cut. If, um, if there is a day of, of national significance to Sahrawis, so for example, Sahrawis, tend to celebrate the anniversary of the de declaration of the Sahrawi Republic, and they celebrate the anniversary of the founding of the Polisario Front. So on those days, there's often a power cut. Um, and if, um, for example, there's a trial of a, a famous Sahrawi political activist, there might be a power cut on, on that day. So Sahrawis, uh, understood blackouts as a form of collective punishment and more widely felt that energy justice was inextricably linked with self-determination. So foreign energy developers were seen as blocking Sahrawi's right to self-determination. Um, Siemens was the most repeated company name that came up in our discussions. And Siemens was despised as an agent of colonialism and an agent of occupation. So, Sahrawi's everyday engagements with energy and occupied Western Sahara mediates their critical positionality to the Moroccan regime 
and their conditionality as an occupied people. And if we read these interactions with energy infrastructure as a mediator of citizenship, you could argue that the energopolitical regime fosters a re rejection of Moroccan citizenship while simultaneously fueling Sahrawi nationalist demands. And um, these are just some pictures of Sahrawi protests against Siemens and other companies. So in the top left, there's a Sahrawi woman speaking at the Siemens annual meeting, which Sahrawis try to do every year. Um, and then there's various <clears throat> protest banners you can see. In the bottom right corner, there's a picture of the Gadim Azik camp. So this was a big camp in the countryside of occupied Western Sahara with about 20,000 inhabitants um, protesting with socioeconomic demands against the plunder of uh, Western Sahara's natural resources and also in favour of independence. And in the picture, it's just been raised to the ground by Moroccan authorities. Um, and so now um, I mentioned at the start of the paper that there's different energy systems in Western Sahara. So I want to move over now to the Sahari state in exile in Algeria, which are also the Sahari refugee camps, and talk a bit, a little bit about what they're doing there and how it's underpinned by Sahari wind imaginaries, and also what um, the Sahari Republic government was planning for the part of Western Sahara that, that they control in terms of energy infrastructure, and again, how that was underpinned by particular understandings of wind, the winds blowing. Um, so just some slides to show you what these camps look like. So you can see there, this is Smara camp. There's five camps in total, and they have names of the cities in, in Western Sahara from which um, the refugees came from. So people from Smara house themselves here in, in Smara camp. Um, this is a small wind turbine that powers the electricity for an arts school in the camps. And this is just a picture of one of the markets in, in the camps. Um, I'll leave you with a picture of the turbine while I talk. So um, first I should say that nomadism is central to Sahari identity um, and also to Sahari claims to the territory that is Western Sahara. And that's been true in the past in a very practical way. So during the first war, in 1975 to 1991, Sahari knowledge of territory allowed them to wage guerrilla warfare techniques. They could move around the desert like fish in water, um, where Moroccan soldiers could not. Um, but nomadism was also key to Sahari claims to Western Sahara in a more abstract way. So Sahari in Arabic literally means of the desert. Um, Sahari nomadic philosophies see Sahari humans as one part of a wider desert ecology that interacts with rather than tries to control the other species living there, um, as well as the weather, the water flows, and the geological formations that also form part of that ecology. Um, and these co parts of the desert ecosystem impact upon and shape the lives of nomads, sometimes helping them, sometimes hindering them. So they're seen as agents. And one of the most forceful agents of the desert ecosystem, highlighted by nomads, um, are the winds. Winds in terms of moving air, and also winds in terms of the aerosols, such as sand and water that winds carry, and also the wind blown. Um, so Aeolian geomorphology, the rock formations that wind has created, and the dunes that, that wind creates. So these are key, seen as key agents that shape nomads' lives in a variety of ways. Um, and if you were to ask a nomad to explain the significance of the winds and of the wind blown, um, if they're talking to an outsider like me, nomads might mention how the blowing of helpful winds and the winds have names. So for example, the Giblia is a helpful wind. Um, the Giblia might um, help a nomad to foretell when rain's gonna come and therefore when shrubs are gonna grow and when pasture is gonna be available for their animals. And a nomad can recognize each of the named winds. So um, 
reaction of its temperature from its force on their skin that denies each wind. Um, they also might mention how a wind can act as a sentinel. So wind carries smells and sounds that can forewarn no weapons of a coming threat or forewarn them of something good. They might also talk about how large deposits of wind-blown sand can, can in turn help them to read the winds through the patterns that winds make on the dunes and the trails that winds leave in the sands. Um, and they might also talk about particular Aeolian geological formations. Um, so one of these are the Galaba, and these Galaba is central to nomads navigation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Calibra later. Um, also central to Nomad's existence in the desert is poetry. Um, there's a Sahari scholar called Bahia Awa, and I've, I've got a reference to his work at the end if you want to look it up. Um, he, his work documents um, in anthropological terms the role of poetry in nomadism. Um, so he looks at how poetry has been a pedagogical tool for helping nomad children learn how to live in the desert. Um, so children would recite poetry every night before sleeping and that would help them to learn the characteristics of the winds, um, the named caliber, um, which are helpful for navigation, astronomy, key botanical knowledge, um, history, um, all sorts. And so poetry allows Sahari nomads to move through the desert. Um, however, um, most, not all, but most refugees now live a sedentary existence in these camps in Algeria. Um, so they're not nomads anymore. Um, I mentioned there was, there were some nomads in the free part of Western Sahara. The numbers were limited because of landmines, but since the outbreak of war in 2020, the, their numbers are diminishing. And in occupied Western Sahara, nomadism is effectively prohibited. So, for example, Morocco has outlawed the pitching of tents. So there's various, there's a legal framework that makes nomadism very, very hard to practice. Um, so this genre of pedagogical poetry is disappearing as the older generation of nomads dies. Um, and this is a political problem for the nationalist cause. Um, on the other hand, Polisario tries to run schools in nomadism, um, and up until 2020, it had been planning energy infrastructure and starting to build energy infrastructure in the part of Western Sahara that it controls in a way that would foster and favour nomadic life. Um, and up until the war, there was um, a wider plan to move the population, the refugee population from Algeria back into the, the, the free part of Western Sahara and they'd been clearing landmines for years for that purpose. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to the infrastructure that was being built there shortly, but I'm going to skip back to poetry now. So um, I've talked about how poetry was traditionally used since um, Spain's exodus and the ongoing decolonial struggle. Sahari poetry has taken on a new role. Um, much poetry now, especially poetry in Sahara's native yeah, which is which is a dialect of Arabic, and also Arabic poetry. You have some Saharis composed in Arabic. Um, much of that poetry has a political role of persuading Saharis to join and sustain the anti-colonial revolution. But there's also a generation of poets that prefer to write and compose in Spanish. And they do so specifically, um, and they state this, to foster solidarity with the Sahari cause among the Spanish speaking world. And that's a key motivation for them. Um, and I want to show you an example of this new generation of Spanish poetry. Um, and the poem I'm going to show you is by this man, Liman Boisha. Um, and it's called Galb, which is the singer of Galaba. The, the Aeolian rock formation that I mentioned earlier, which is key for navigation. So this is um, a translation into English of, of a gallop, which was originally written in Spanish. So I'll just read it out for you. A traveler asks me, what is the meaning of galb? I tell him, for example, 
that Miak is a blemish in the belly of the earth, that Ziza, for example, is the babe of a breast, and that the wing of a dune can touch the sea of the sky. I say, for example, that in the high peaks of prismatic dawns, there is much sleeping life rubbing its skin, that in the transient stone, there are stationary craters, islands emerging from an ocean of nothing. For example, a galb might be the name of a girl engraved into the eyelashes of a cave. As tedious as the navel of the Sahara, galb is a heart, a heart of stone. So if there are any Arabic speakers, you might know it actually does mean heart in Arabic too. Um, so in contrast to the colonial energy regime's imaginations of wind, which we've looked at through reading Siemens' discourse on Saharan winds in Blue Desert, and they imagine the desert as a wasteland, and the winds as wild and hostile and useless. Um, this poem emphasizes the agency of non-human parts of the wind-blown desert and its interaction with Sahari nomads in a way that doesn't emphasize human control or domination. We see from the traveler mentioned in the first line of, of the poem that this poem is directed towards outsiders and it teaches the reader as an outsider a little about navigation using Aeolian geomorphology by focusing on the notion of the galb. And it's got several named galiba throughout the poem. So Miek, Ziza, for example. Um, and the poem reflects the cartography of the desert um, so the landmarks named in the poem appear in order of their location from northeast to southwest in actual Western Sahara. Um, and the landmarks that are, are Galiba, rock, rock formations made by Aeolian processes. Um, by highlighting the agencies of various non-humans of the desert, Iman Boisha asks us to, to question human exceptionalism. Um, there's a lot I, I would like to say about wind aesthetics in the poem, but I won't go into that for um, reasons of time. Um, so wind imaginaries are a battleground in this conflict. On the one side, there's Siemens Desert Wind, which is key to evoking the idea of terra nullius, no man's land, wasteland, which was so key to European colonialism. The loud and destructive winds are themselves waste and barbarism, and they must be tamed and made useful for capitalist profit, um, which Sahari's implicitly incapable of doing. Um, and therefore it's okay to colonize them. The wind-infused colonial logic underpins the material energy system that furthers colonialism in all sorts of oppressive material ways, um, and which inadvertently reproduces a Sahari identity in opposition to it. Then we have the rather different wind imaginary of Saharawis, whose nomadic cosmologies reject human exceptionalism and claim Western Sahara not because they own it or wish to control and, and dominate um, all its more than human components, but because they are of it. Wind shapes nomads' lives in numerous ways, and at the imaginary level, it helps Saharis to communicate their culture and their traditions um, or, and their claims to Western Sahara to potential foreign allies, in this case, a Spanish-speaking public. Um, so I'm interested in the wider project about the implications of these meanings that we give to wind for renewable energy rollout. Um, so you have Siemens case and how those colonial wind discourses inform an energy system that um, furthers colonialism and occupation in material ways. Um, so if we look at how Saharawis are developing energy systems. Um, it's, it's a little different to the corporate model, which we see over the, the other side of the, the military wall. Um, so Sahari nomadic understandings of wind and the wind blown place Sahari humans and the wind within the desert ecosystem of many non-human agents. And I think this could underpin a more just and decolonial energy rollout. Um, so my contention is that nomadic wind interaction and how nomad poets frame and mobilize these interactions challenges and offers an alternative to a colonial um, wind imaginaries give us a way into a wider Sahari nomadic ideas that refute human exceptionalism in their desert ecology, 
um, in these nomadic cosmologies, egalitarianism is key. Um, and the idea of wind being something hostile, something that should be managed and controlled, is alien. Um, so, in terms of the energy infrastructure that was planned for the the, the Sahara contract um, zone of Western Sahara, um, it was mediating a national identity rooted in nomadic philosophies and ethics in two main ways. I think. So, firstly, there was portability. So the aspired to energy system in in West in Polisario controlled Western Sahara was designed to suit a nomadic life. Um, so um, there are small wind turbines built next to communal wells um, for all nomads to use. Um, and in terms of plans for when they had hoped to move the refugee population to free West, Western Sahara. Um, the focus was on self-sufficiency and small scale developments that wouldn't intrude heavily on the desert ecosystem of which Saharis were part. Um, so I mentioned there's already a number of communal wells. There's several clinics in the free zone for nomads which are, were powered by electric wind turbines um, and officials of the energy ministry um, and electrical energies of the Sahari Republic in exile explained to me that the plan was for public services to be powered by a mix of, of solar and wind, but there weren't plans for private homes to be networked, rather each tent would have its own form, some form of portable solar energy. Um, and egalitarianism was also at the heart of the plans, uh, especially when it comes to women's rights, um, but also it's seen as linking to um, the Sahari Republic's strong socialist national identity, um, which they they say is rooted um, in nomadic non-hierarchical traditions. So to give a past example from the refugee camps, the women's training centers, which exist in each of the five camps, were at the top of the list for connection, um, along with hospitals um, in the 1980s, which is when um, solar panels first began to arrive in the camps. The poignant thing is that this nomadic energy future is on hold now since the return to war. Um, so this space that Polisario controls in Western Sahara, which was envisaged to be a place that nomads would return to, is now a war zone. Actually, the return to war in 2020, one of the first retaliations of the Moroccan government um, against Saharis in occupied territory was um, a mass slaughter of their camels. Um, and since then we've seen, as I mentioned, drone strikes against nomads in, in the Sahari controlled zone. So for that reason, I'll end with this question, a nomadic energy future, will there be one? I hope there will be. And I missed this picture. So this, these, you can see a galb um, in, in the, the, the foreground there and others behind. Um, so that's all from me in a moment. I'll ask if you have any questions, um, but just to give you these references. So the um, work by, by Bahia Awa, Sahari anthropologist, and this book, Tiri Surutas Literarias, takes you on a tour of Tiris, one of the um, most beautiful parts of Western Sahara through poetry and poetry um, attached to landmarks. Um, you get an insight how it, of how it's used for navigation and so on. Um, and Liman Boisha, the, the poet um, by Poetit, this is one of his collections, in Madeira. I used a map by Western Sahara Resource Watch and that map came from this report um, which looks at um, the, the wind developments in occupied Western Sahara. Um, so hopefully I will have a book out on this eventually and this is the the working title um the paper that i wrote with my colleagues hamza lakhan and mahmoud lemadal on sahari perceptions of the um energy system in occupied western sahara is there and you also have a an article on aeolian aesthetics and sahari poetry um which i i didn't get around to talking about with reference to limam's poem but i do in in that article um and just one last thing. So if you're interested in Sahari poetry, um, on this website here, you'll find some recordings of poets reciting their works. 
as well as um, life histories of each poet. And there's just a few up there at the moment, but there will be lots more um, that will gradually appear. And there eventually will be translations of all the poems into English and English language transcripts of all the, the life history interview. So if poetry is something that is of interest to you, please check that out. Thank you for listening so patiently. I hope um, it was clear and interesting. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so very much. That was a very interesting presentation. And as somebody wrote in the Q&A from a part of the world that we usually don't hear much about. So thank you so very much. And okay. uh, we have people raising their hands. You can raise your hand to ask a question or you can type it in the Q&A uh, section. So let's give Dr. Aminu Hayatu. You can unmute yourself and ask yeah, Okay, so um, thank you very much. That's uh, quite a very beautiful presentation and uh, well um, elaborate. And I just want to, um, you know, I don't know um, how to profile uh, the kind of uh, nomadic uh, uh, movement we have um, uh, around uh, Northwestern Nigeria, for example. We always have this kind of, um, uh, uh, community clashes between the settlers and the indigenous, and most of the indigenous in uh, some states in the northwest Nigeria claim that uh, the Fulani are uh, settlers in those areas because of the terrain of their movement and all of that. And then after some time, they have come to settle in those places and uh, you know, a lot of things, uh, uh, you know, uh, happened. some of them claim in the land in those areas, and then some of them have moved on, you know, even across uh, the Sahara. So I really, well, um, the difficulty in this kind of profile really makes the picture so complex in such a way that uh, to give it a kind of definition is very difficult. I don't know how uh, one can throw some light into this for better understanding. Okay. The, the settler population living alongside the indigenous population. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I've made it sound like it's quite black and white, and it, it isn't really. As um, before Spanish colonization of West Sahara, as I mentioned, the Saharawis were nomads, and um, Saharawis lived in what is today Western Sahara, but also South Morocco, um, Western Algeria, um, and Mauritania. Um, so some of the, what I've called settlers that Morocco moved into the territory, some of them were um, ethnic Sahrawi. So it's not as black and white as perhaps I've um, inadvertently put it in my presentation. Um, and um, another, Part of the conflict is um, the, the role of culture and cultural appropriation and cultural exploitation. Um, so, uh, for example, when the UN declared the ceasefire in 1991 on the promise of a referendum independence, um, the UN had a mission called MINUSA, which is still in occupied Western Sahara, and the their mandate was to organize this referendum and the first action was to register all the people who should be eligible to vote. Um, so indigenous Sahrawi. And there was some strange maneuvers at that time. And, and one of them was um, Morocco paid for classes in Hassaniya dialect for Moroccan settlers to try and make them appear to be Sahrawis. And we see more actions like that. Uh, where the Moroccan state fosters a Sahrawi identity among Moroccans to try and make a Sahrawi culture seem like a more part of a multicultural Morocco. Um, so it is a, an, a really important and interesting point that, that you've um, raised there, Dr. Hayatu. Thank you. I, I hope I've responded to your question. Thank you. Um, Blessing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Oh, okay, my name is Dr. Blessing James, and uh, I'm in Morocco presently and doing research in Morocco. And uh, you do not live in Morocco technically, and uh, the topic is a very hot topic internationally. But uh, I thank you for your for your talk and presentation. And so uh, for this issue, uh, it's uh, a bother and the uh, land uh, kind of uh, conflict between uh, the people here. And uh, this place is owned by uh, the Moroccan people, like you, you said in your email. But uh, from your discussion, there is no clear um, uh, affirmation to uh, what you've mentioned. So uh, I, I don't know whether uh, there are other alternative view to this concept because uh, these uh, land issues, and if you look at uh, the old map, you want to talk about uh, the fact that Mauritania and Morocco is one country, and uh, now uh, you talk about uh, claim to Mauritania and claim to Morocco about uh, these uh, important issues. So this is just my question. Okay. Um, so um, the the question is if is is if there are alternative views um, to what I presented here. Yeah. James, could you could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Dr. Blessing, do you want to repeat your question? Yes, I want to repeat my question. I mean, uh, uh, Dr. John only talk about uh, the fact that Mauritania, Morocco, and Spain, uh, this is uh, about this kind of uh, border uh, argument or agreement. So uh, I think uh, this place is owned by Morocco, but uh, internationally recognized, uh, like you talk about Donald Trump uh, recognizing and uh, Morocco also recognizing uh, the United States. So, but uh, from your from your from your uh, talk, you've not totally affirmed that uh, this area is owned by Morocco confidently. Okay, so it's um it's a it's a legally occupied by Morocco two thirds of the territory. So for the UN. It's still a colony. Uh, it was never decolonized or a non self governing territory. I guess that's the official status. So, although the Trump administration recognized Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara, that has no legal bearing. So, it doesn't make the Moroccan occupation legal. So, I guess Morocco is the de facto administrative power. Um, but it's in terms of international law, it's an illegal occupation. Um, so I hope that, that clarifies um, my perspective on, um, on that. Yeah, and I guess I have the question, has uh, the African Union, does it have any stand regarding? The African Union is really um, a really interesting point. So, in 2017, and the reason why it hadn't joined was because the African Union had admitted the Sahrawi Republic as um, a member from 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 the start. So, um, in in protest at that, Morocco. That's why it, it didn't join until 2017. And the African Union has published its own opinion on the issue of natural resource exploitation. It's actually a really detailed um, uh, legal um, opinion on that matter specifically. Um, yeah, I mean, if anyone's interested in reading that, I can I can hunt it out and send them the link. But that was, um, I think that was 2016, they, they, they published that. So. Thank you. I can see there's a question from Ana Ribera in the chat. Shall I respond to that? Yeah, 
Yes, please. Um, so Anna has asked, Anna Rivera has asked them, what has been the role of the UN and World Bank in supporting green colonialism in Western Sahara under the pretext of environmental benefits? Um, in terms of the UN agency, if that's the right word, that has had a, a role here as far as I know, is the UN C. And um, in terms of the. Um, We're not hearing you very well. I don't know why. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, so the, the, the UNFCCC, um, it doesn't distinguish between renewable energy developments um, built in Morocco and in occupied Western Sahara. So when. Um, Morocco is highlighting uh, its green credentials or the share of energy um, that comes from renewable sources. Um, it, it, it's allowed to share uh, the developments it has in, in occupied Western Sahara um, by the UNFCCC. Um, and when reporting to the um, Morocco's commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement, so at all the COP conferences, um, it does the same thing. Um, in terms of the World Bank, I'm not sure if it has played any role, but um, the the honest answer is um, I, I don't know if it has funded anything. I don't think so, but um, I'm not completely sure. Thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding language. I'm just interested in knowing what's the dynamic uh, in the occupied territories like okay. what's, what's the relationship between arabic spanish the local languages i see yeah okay so um a lot of old Sahrawis born before 1975 speak spanish and in the occupied territory the european language the colonial languages is a hot political issue so uh when <clears throat> Morocco invaded, they pulled down all the Spanish language signs and put up French ones. Um, and um, if you ask a pro-independence Sahrawi about the name of the capital city, they, they'll say El Ayun, which is the Spanish um, transliteration of the, of the place name. Um, Whereas um, a Moroccan would say Layoun, the French transcription of, of the place name, and um, the place name came from, from Arabic. So um, the European colonial languages are a, a point, are another battleground. Um, and this is another reason that, uh, that the Sahari poets that compose in Spanish, um, so one of their reasons, for, their stated reasons for doing so is to engage possible Spanish-speaking allies, um, but it's also to remain Spain of its um, betrayal of Sahrawis. So the, the language choice um, is politically significant there too. Um, and um, Sahrawis speak a dialect of Arabic called Hassaniya. Um, and um, until the 2000s, Morocco pressed that, so um, you might be reprimanded for speaking Hassaniya in, in public. S school pupils would be punished if they spoke Hassaniya in the classroom and so on. Um, now, uh, what we see are Hassaniya cultural festivals in the south of Morocco. And this, in the past, there was this payment of Hassaniya classes for Moroccans, so it's this cultural appropriation that um, tries to make Sahrawi culture seem like one subculture within a, a Moroccan multicultural society. So the first phase was to try and stamp out Sahrawi cultural markers. And because that never wasn't successful, Sahrawis resisted that. There's now an attempt to appropriate their culture, to make them, to eliminate them in, in that way, I suppose. Thank you very much. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Oh. 
Let me see. I think someone might have commented, but I can't see it. Um, is there a comment there? That I'm missing? No, I don't. I don't see it. Okay, so if we don't have questions or comments, we want to thank you so very much again, Dr. Allen, for coming today and sharing your interesting research with us. We very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you, audience, for being here and for asking your questions. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Dr. Sarah, and thanks to everyone who's come. And... Thank you. Thank you very much.